Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, the webinar of the International Society for Telemedicine and Health. Um, we uh, are so happy to see you again. Um, this uh, is our webinar uh, focused on hypertension. Um, and uh, I'm very uh, proud uh, to uh, moderate this webinar along uh, with my colleague, uh, uh, Anastasia and with Adolfo. Um, we have uh, exceptional um, speakers, uh, Professor Richard McManus uh, from uh, University of Oxford and Professor Stephanie Ombono, Omboni uh, from the Italian Institute of Telemedicine. Um, I will uh, start uh, by uh, introducing my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg, which will present just a few words about our society. Uh, then I will give the word to my colleague, Dr. Anastasia Mihailudu, um, for the kickoff of this webinar. So Adolfo, please, you have the word. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Alexandro, coordinator of the Telecardiologist Working Group of International Indian Health. At this moment, I will share my screen just a second please okay i hope you can see me and i will just switch uh, my camera off so that can improve the quality of the just a second and then well this is the last slide okay now it's fine i hope you can hear is that okay for you yes okay so, uh, on behalf of the International Society for Telemedicine and Health, I welcome all of you, distinguished speakers, ISFTH members and partners, to this very important session. So, we we'll welcome some of you. And this session is organized by the Telecardiology Working Group of the International Society for Telemedicine in conjunction with the ISFTH Executive Secretariat and the working groups committee. So before going through the outstanding topics of today's presentation, it's my mission and honor, I should say, to say some brief words about the International Society for Telemedicine and the Health, mainly directed to those that are not yet familiar to the ISFTH. So the second slide shows it is an NGO, a non-for-profit organization, in official relations to the World Health Organization, founded in 1997, exactly 23 years ago in Japan. So the headquarters of the ISFTH is located in and the mission of our society is to facilitate the international dissemination of knowledge and experience in telemedicine and e-health, providing access to recognized experts in the field worldwide. So currently the International Society for Telemedicine and E-Health has affiliated members from over a hundred countries in all continents and distributed in different national members, associations, institutions, individuals, students and nurses. Uh, the society counts on the support of several working groups, like those presented in this slide. And the working groups are in fact of the ISFTH, composed by colleagues that are responsible for organizing practical activities throughout the year. Webinars like this one are an important segment of these initiatives. Also very important to mention that the society organizes conference every year that usually rotate around the world. Unfortunately, due to the current pandemic of the conference planned to take place in Lisbon in March 2020 and the next one in Takazaki, Japan in October, temporarily cancelled. At this moment, there is something new on the ISFTH website, on the main page we talk of a specific chapter dedicated to the theme of COVID-19. That is an important area through which ISFTH members and partners can share their information, experiences, 
and solutions concerning the current COVID-19. A lot of information at this moment is available as part of this new chapter. Uh, other organized by the ISFTH and provided for the affiliated members include the ISFTH newsletter through it and the journal of the ISFTH that is uh, has edit an editorial board composed by Marina Jordanov from Canada and Maurice Mars from South Africa. So affiliated members are invited to participate through both initiatives. So those interested in joining the ISFTH can affiliate through different membership categories, as I mentioned. So the attention that nurses and students represent a free of charge membership categories. Uh, requesting affiliation is really a quite easy and simple process. Just visit the ISFTH website and go to the how to join area. And finally, the last slide, but not the least, this is the ISFTH website. You are all invited to participate of our society. So at this moment, I thank you very much for uh, the minutes I spent with this introduction and wish you all a very nice session. So Dr. Alexandra, please, it's your time. Thank you very thank much, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, most of the attendees today are familiar with our webinars. So um, I will uh, proceed uh, uh, with presenting my co-host, Dr. Anastasia Mihailidou, uh, which is a senior hospital scientist at the cardiology department of uh, Royal North Square Hospital, uh, Northern Sydney Local Health District. She is the head of the cardiovascular and hormonal research lab at the Colling Institute and also a honorary a senior lecturer, Faculty of Medicine and uh, Health Sciences at Macquarie University. Um, Anastasia uh, is on the executive committee of the High uh, Blood Pressure Research Council of Australia and is responsible for the communications portfolio. Uh, also, my dear colleague is uh, uh, part of the International Society of Hypertension uh, Women um, so, uh, of the International Society of Hypertension uh, uh, Research Committee. She also serves as part of the ACNAP social media communication team, uh, that is uh, the association uh, of the ESC, European Society of Cardiology, and uh, she's part also of uh, the editorial team uh, of Hypertension Journal. Uh, I would also uh, like to uh, uh, especially thank Anastasia for uh, the uh, exceptional dedication she put into this webinar and mostly uh, or, or most, most of the uh, exceptional results and the uh, invites were the result of her work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. I would also uh, like to thank uh, both of the speakers which we will introduce soon. But first of all, I will give the word to Anastasia. Thank you very much, Stefana, for that kind invitation. And I'm very much looking forward to this uh, exciting webinar um, on a very important topic of telemedicine. Um, it gives me, without wasting too much time, and we need to listen to our speakers, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard McManus, who is a GP family physician in Oxford and he's Professor of Primary Care Research at Oxford University. If I may use your Christian name, Richard, if you don't mind. Um, I've known Richard well before Twitter uh, or social media. And for the past 20 years, um, Richard has done exceptional uh, research in the hypertension field, particularly with the Tasman series of studies of self-monitoring and self-management of blood pressure in hypertension. And recently, it's exciting work in um, self-monitoring in pregnancy. It's known as the BUMP studies, um, appropriately, uh, as we've seen on social media. And he tells us that he will be reporting on those results next year, so that's exciting. 
and whether it's tonight or early this morning in, in, in Australia here, he will discuss the trial evidence for telemedicine in hypertension and in particular telemonitoring using examples from his own trial portfolio, uh, as well as the literature. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Richard, uh, who's going to talk on telemedicine in hypertension management, 20 years of trials and experiences. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Anastasia, and, uh, and the rest of the panel. I am going to share my screen. Oh, Alex, you need to give me screen, please. Okay, so just to start off my presentation, Uh, with my disclosures, I just uh, as we're talking about telemonitoring, I just draw people's attention to the fact that I am doing some work with Omron, but I've used monitors from all the major blood pressure monitor manufacturers in my work. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you uh, with a little bit of an introduction and then think about the prerequisites for uh, telemonitoring in practice. I'm going to talk to you about three kinds of trials. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Tasman IV uh, trial, which is a trial which looked at telemonitoring uh, being used for uh, family physicians and GPs to titrate antihypertensive medication. And then we'll look at uh, trials with a bit more intervention, the self-management trial, the first one we did, uh, Tasman II, along with Tasman SR and then uh, looking at uh, pharmacist input in the hyperlink trial, which I hope will link in quite nicely uh, to Stefano's uh, work, which a lot of it is with uh, pharmacists, which you'll hear afterwards, and then try and bring it all together. So uh, essentially we know that uh, looking at the literature uh, overall, and this uh, is uh, a figure from one of Stefano's uh, systematic reviews that the Telemedicine and hypertension does, does seem to work here. Overall, we've got uh, a weighted mean uh, office systolic blood pressure reduction of about five millimetres of mercury uh, with telemonitoring. But hopefully what I'm going to do over, uh, over the talk is to show you how that breaks down and, and, and what, what's important. So in terms of prerequisites, I think you, you need broadly four things. You need patients who are happy to measure their own blood pressure. You need uh, monitors that are validated and a system for transmitting the results. Uh, willing clinicians uh, and then obviously evidence of benefit. What's the point of doing things? Now, evidence of benefit, uh, I'm going to talk about the trial evidence. Clearly, um, evidence of benefit is slightly different at the moment when we're in a pandemic situation in many countries uh, and where actually we just need a system that will let us have a blood pressure that we can do something with. But uh, I, I'll hopefully show you that uh, with telemedicine and telemonitoring, you can actually do better than that and, and actually get benefit from the use of it. So willing patients, uh, we know that uh, in specialist uh, situations, such as perhaps Italy, which you're going to hear about, uh, really the majority of people can uh, uh, telemonitor in the UK, where I'm based, uh, the most recent data su suggests about 30 or 40 percent of people with hypertension self-monitor. If you talk about the general population, maybe 10 or 20 percent have measured their blood pressure at some time, perhaps in a kiosk or perhaps using a friend's monitor. What about monitors? Well, and, and, until uh, the 21st century, uh, there was a bit of an issue with, with accurate monitors, but these days, uh, really quite widespread availability of monitors, some of which can work with a smartphone. Uh, there are useful lists of monitors that are, uh, are validated. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, intervention from George Sturgeo and colleagues, Stride BP. Uh, in the UK, we've got the British and Irish Hypertension Society, which is, has one of the longest lived lists of validated monitors. But using a validated monitor is very important. You can then uh, potentially uh, send these results uh, through uh, integrated telemonitoring systems. This is one, in, again, in the UK that uses the Apple Health system. There are lots, lots of others. Um, I don't think one system is necessarily proven to be any better than the other. It just needs to be a system that, that works. And we'll hear about uh, several different systems this evening. 
So one issue that, that is often brought up by physicians is what about the monitors that patients uh, have themselves? Are they accurate? Well, just this week, we've got a paper out where we went into uh, eight practices in the UK and just asked the patients uh, to send us in their monitors if they'd like to get them uh, checked. And we looked at over 300 uh, monitors, uh, about three quarters of them passed tests, but importantly, monitors that were from a validated model uh, that were up to four years old, so less than five years old, uh, were really pretty accurate. 95% of them passed, which is broadly equivalent to if you go into a, either a hospital or a family physician's office and, and check the monitors there, uh, you get similar levels of accuracy. And obviously the monitors in hospitals and family physician's offices are being looked after much, much perhaps uh, much more carefully than, than a, in a patient's uh, own house. So that's, I think, very reassuring. Uh, cheap, old and unvalidated monitors, particularly those with large cuffs, were more likely to fail. And, and actually cuff failures were uh, responsible for about half of the failures, particularly in the older monitors. What about willing clinicians? Well, again, in, uh, this is from the UK, and we'll, we'll hear later uh, about uh, experience in Italy. But uh, the vast majority of uh, family physicians in the UK have patients who self-monitor their blood pressure. Um, around a half now have got monitors which they can lend out. Some people have monitors in their waiting room. Now, clearly, they're probably not using those monitors uh, at the moment. Uh, people are using self-monitoring both for diagnosis and uh, for uh, ongoing management. This was before the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, clearly now uh, self-monitoring uh, uh, along with telemedicine is, 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 is really the only option for many people in, in the pandemic situation. So what about benefit? Well, when we started thinking about um, self-monitoring uh, and looking at the evidence, really the, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the century, there are a couple of quite elegant studies uh, which looked at titrating antihypertensive medication using uh, self-monitored blood pressure. And unfortunately, both of those studies were essentially negative, or if not showed potential harm from self-monitoring. And so there's a bit of a, a question mark over it. But the thing with both of these studies is that they use the same target uh, at home as they did uh, for uh, the comparative office measurements. So we now know that the home blood measured blood pressure um, is around five systolic over five diastolic uh, lower than office uh, blood pressure in terms of targets. And, and so that was a key thing. Uh, and so we set out to see uh, whether using uh, more modern uh, self-monitoring equipment uh, and using a telemonitoring system uh, with family physicians titrating antihypertensive medication, whether this uh, was an effective uh, intervention. This was uh, published uh, in the Lancet a couple of years ago. Our, our research question was, as you can see there, is titration of antihypertensive medication with or without telemonitoring more effective than usual care? Uh, and our primary outcome was systolic blood pressure after a year. We included people who were over 55 with hypertension uh, who were taking no more than three antihypertensive medications. And we excluded those people uh, who had atrial fibrillation because self-monitoring uh, equipment doesn't work very well in that case. Uh, and obviously those with dementia, pregnancy and so on who are generally not included in trials. And we randomised them to three different groups. Uh, the first group just used a piece of paper to write their uh, readings down, but we asked them to systematically record their blood pressure for the first week of every month and to send their uh, paper-based recordings into their practice just using the post. The second group, we used uh, a text-based digital intervention. So this was using SMS manage messaging uh, and patients were able to send their readings in. We used a text-based system uh, because uh, many of the older patients at the time we were doing this trial, which was uh, three or four years ago, uh, didn't have smartphones. Uh, these days we've adapted a lot of the algorithms to use in smartphones as those become more prevalent. The control group, which is the third group, uh, just carried on with usual care, which was largely clinic-based monitoring. Our primary outcome was systolic blood pressure af after a year, uh, and we found that both the telemonitoring group and the self-monitoring group uh, had a significant reduction in blood pressure after a year, about five millimetres uh, 
in the telemonitoring group, four millimetres systolic in the self-monitoring alone group. Uh, and you can see here that at six months, the telemonitoring group had a significantly lower blood pressure as well, suggesting that perhaps blood pressure was lowered quick, quicker in the telemonitoring group. The reductions here are what you might expect from about a third of a standard dose of antihypertensive medication. And so that's important when we come to think about the mechanism. So we looked at medication prescription in terms of this on the, both the number of antihypertensive drugs and the overall uh, daily dose. Uh, and the defined daily dose allows you to take into account both number and dose of antihypertensives, which we showed were significantly increased in both of our intervention groups. But there was perhaps uh, uh, only about half of the increase in antihypertensive medications that you might expect from the blood pressure drop, suggesting, uh, and I think we know from the literature, that some of the effect that we're seeing here is probably due to increased adherence in antihypertensive medication as well as increased numbers of antihypertensive medications. In terms of adverse events, essentially there was no difference between the groups in adverse uh, events, and we looked at all sorts of things, including hypertension-specific things such as dizziness and impotence. We did some cost-effectiveness modelling. Uh, this was uh, published the following year in hypertension, led by uh, Mark Monaghan and Sue Jowett, and this showed that both self-monitoring and telemonitoring were highly cost-effective under the UK criteria, which is uh, £20,000 uh, a, a quality. Uh, and there was quite a lot of uncertainty as to which was the most cost effective between telemonitoring and self-monitoring. We also did some uh, qualitative work where we interviewed patients uh, around this. And, and here are a couple of quotes where you can see that the patients liked uh, the ability to telemonitor and uh, felt that, that uh, they were getting uh, very prompt uh, feedback, which they were uh, having automatically. Uh, but anyway, they liked that. Uh, and the GPs and family physicians felt that uh, it improved uh, the, the, the partnership with the patients, which I think is great. So our conclusions, uh, we know that uh, self-monitoring, it gives us better measurement of blood pressure uh, than office measurement. But also now from this work that uh, self-monitoring was feasible and cost effective and effective in the UK and patients liked it. But relatively small reductions in blood pressure, one might argue, and one might argue relatively small differences between telemonitoring and self-monitoring. However, would point uh, to the fact that the self-monitoring alone was done in a systematic way, which is perhaps one of the key parts to the intervention. So next, um, I, I'm going to... Uh, go on to a slightly more intensive intervention, uh, what happens if you give patients control. And what uh, I'm going to describe are two, two trials, the TASMIN-2 trial, which was a telemonitoring trial uh, uh, around self-management of hy uh, hypertension in people with hypertension on their own, uh, and then the subsequent TASMIN-SR trial, which looked at higher risk groups. By self-management, I mean self-monitoring with self-titration. So this is asking patients to adjust their own medication following a pre-specified schedule. Uh, GPs and patients meet at the beginning of the trial and decide some medication changes the patient can make without needing to reconsult. Uh, and then uh, medications can be added or, or increased. If the patient's blood pressure drops, they get asked to go and see their uh, GP or nurse and, ha and have their medications adjusted. Uh, and uh, one can do additional uh, things such as uh, blood tests and so on around uh, the, the self-monitoring if one needs to, for instance, with uh, monitoring an ACE inhibitor. Patients use a, a simple color chart, red, amber, green, blue, uh, to adjust their medication. Uh, and this chart is replicated uh, on a uh, on an app in the telemonitoring systems we're using now. Uh, in the old days, the telemonitoring was rather more steam driven than we're able to do uh, in the smartphone age. Uh, the, importantly, again, the blood pressure targets are adjusted for a lower home blood pressure and we used lower targets in the high risk groups. In both trials, we got significantly lower systolic blood pressure uh, after a year, which again was our primary outcome. Uh, 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 five and a half millimetres in the hypertension trial, which was TASMIN-2, which was published in the Lancet in 2010, and uh, nine millimetres in the TASMIN-SR trial, which was published in JAMA in 2014. 
around 80% of the patients in these trials were able to self-manage uh, and they uh, increased their medication uh, more in the intervention groups uh, in both trials. Uh, telemonitoring was mostly a safety net in this work, but note uh, that the technology we were using was 10 year, te more than 10 years old now, uh, and that's very different to what, say, what, what one can use now. Uh, and the trials that we're, we're doing now are, uh, are testing this sort of intervention uh, using uh, current telemonitoring to give feedback. In fact, we have a, a, a trial that's under review at one of, the, one of the journals at the moment that hopefully we might be able to talk to you about later in the year. Side effects, again, were very similar between the two groups. I've just circled their ankle swelling in our Tasman 2 trial, which was increased in the intervention group, probably because uh, of uh, increased use of calcium channel blockers in the intervention group in that trial. Again, we looked at cost effectiveness and both trials were highly cost effective. Uh, around £2,000 of quality uh, for men, £6,000 of quality for women in Tasman 2. Uh, that's slightly less cost effective for women because of reduced cardiovascular events in women. In Tasman SR, uh, uh, self-management -man was what's called dominant, which means it was both more effective and cheaper. We looked at whether patients uh, follow instructions uh, and found that actually uh, about 55% of uh, the instructions were followed in the hypertension trial, about 70% of instructions were followed in the high risk trial. You might think that's not particularly good, but when you look at the best that doctors can do, it's about 45%. So really patients are better at doing this than, than, than many of us, I'm afraid. The final group uh, I'm gonna think about are now more high intensity co-interventions. And the example I'm going to use is, is a rather elegant trial uh, looking at, 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 uh, at pharmacists. By high intensity co-interventions, I mean things that require active one-to-one -one input from health professionals over and above the more automated telemonitoring systems we've been talking about so far. In the example that I'm going to use, it's the hyperlink trial, which is Karen Margolis' uh, trial, which involved weekly telemonitored blood pressure of at least six readings over, uh, over a week, fortnightly pharmacist-led phone calls, plus titration and lifestyle advice. And in this trial, uh, they're... Uh, primary outcome was in terms of blood pressure control, and this was significantly better uh, in the telemonitoring uh, group, uh, nearly double the number uh, controlled. It also led to significantly lower blood pressure reduction, and again, uh, led to increased antihypertensive medication use with similar increases in antihypertensive medication use that we saw in our self-management trials. Uh, intervention patients all used uh, the pharmacist that was offered to them and had an average of 11 visits with over half an hour uh, per visit. So this is really very intensive uh, intervention. Uh, and as you can see, they're pretty expensive, around $1,200 uh, dollars or euros per patient. So how do we fit this all together? Well, we've been able to do uh, what's called an individual patient data meta-analysis where we've got the data from 25 trials, about 8,500 uh, individual patients' data. And we've uh, looked at what happens. And basically, trials with telemonitoring alone definitely do have an effect, as I've shown you. As you do more with telemonitoring, such as self-management, you get increased uh, uh, blood pressure reduction. And as you do the really high-intensity trials, as I've just shown you in the last uh, example from Karen Margolis, uh, you get the most uh, effect in terms of blood pressure reduction. So the bottom line, uh, as I come to the end of my talk, uh, is that telemonitoring results in significantly lower blood pressure than usual care, which is certainly su sustained after 12 months. I haven't shown you the data, but there are data showing that it, uh, these sorts of reductions are uh, go on for longer than 12 months. Increased medication seems to likely to be the main mechanism and the more you do alongside telemonitoring, the greater effect. So the question I would ask uh, the audience is, are you using telemonitoring now? And perhaps you can uh, tell us about that in the question answering session later. I'd like to thank the funders of this work, which was the National Institute of Health Research in the UK. Lots and lots of people helped me. Uh, here are a, a, a few of them. My 
Twitter tag is on, is, is on here and I'll just leave you with the slide from the, from the society with some of their details. Thank you, Richard. I'll hand over to Alex now. Alex, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah, technology is very difficult these days. So thank you, thank you very much, Anastasia. Thank you very much, Richard, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we will uh, try to answer the questions at the end uh, of the two presentations, so after Stefano's uh, presentation. Um, so I have the pleasure to present to you Professor Stefano Omboni. Uh, Professor Omboni is the current director of the Italian Institute of Tal Medicine, uh, a research center, center located nearby Varese in Italy and is the chief researcher at the scientific research department of cardiology uh, of the first Moscow State Medical University in Russia. He is also a member of the guideline writing committee of the working group of blood pressure monitoring and cardiovascular vari variability of the Italian and European Society of Hypertension. Uh, he's also a member of the European Society of Cardiology of Hypertension uh, and also uh, of uh, uh, the ESC. Uh, so, Stefano, uh, you have the word. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you for inviting me to speak at uh, this uh, very interesting webinar. I thank you and Anastasia, of course. And I share my screen. Okay, so hypertension is a, a highly prevalent condition in the population worldwide. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a good deal of patients are still undiagnosed and those who are diagnosed and treated are often poorly controlled. So the point is, what can we do to improve detection and control of hypertension? Of course, uh, the first uh, approach is to measure blood pressure. And we don't measure blood pressure uh, so often as it is required. Uh, we should measure with accurate blood pressure monitors and we should uh, rely more often on out of office blood pressure. You may know that, for instance, uh, uh, not only home blood pressure monitoring, but particularly uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is considered a gold standard for um, evaluating uh, an individual uh, blood pressure level. A major problem is also a physician inertia. Uh, when managing uh, hypertensive uh, patients. And of course, another important problem is uh, the low uh, compliance to treatment in some patients. But there is another problem, which is communication. We need to establish uh, a more, uh, a tighter communication between uh, healthcare professionals and patients because these may improve outcomes. And this can be done with e-health and particularly with telemedicine. Uh, there are several randomized controlled trials that in the past um, clearly demonstrated that um, telemedicine can be useful to improve hypertension management. A few years ago, we uh, um, made and we published uh, a meta-analysis of these randomized control studies where we clearly demonstrated that uh, home blood pressure telemonitoring can improve blood pressure control compared to usual care. But there are also additional benefits which have been already in, partly shown by Richard and these include uh, 
uh, in, um, intensification of treatment, uh, reduce frequency of office consultations, improve quality of life. There is also some preliminary, not uh, uh, complete evidence that um, telemedicine can also improve uh, compliance to treatment, drug safety is of course uh, maybe, maybe cost effective and um, may on the long term reduce the frequency of hospitalization or death. What is important, uh, and uh, this has been anticipated by Richard, uh, mm, telemedicine is uh, essential um, and is um, useful if it is uh, part of uh, a multinodal, multidisciplinary approach. And for instance, there is evidence that uh, a physician pharmacist collaborative practice can be particularly effective in improving blood pressure control and hypertensive patients. This is um, a meta-analysis we, we published uh, the last year showing uh, um, that randomized controlled trials uh, involving a, a pharmacist intervention uh, with uh, a physician supervision can improve blood pressure control of hypertensive patients. But when this uh, uh, intervention is uh, withdrawn, the uh, blood pressure um, control is less consistent, uh, indicating that uh, telemedicine is effective is if it is sustained over time. Of course, Telehealth and telemedicine is uh, useful, but is not very well implemented in practice because there are still several barriers. There are cultural barriers, infrastructural, uh, financial, of course, uh, legal and ethical barriers. There is limited proof of long-term clinical efficacy. There are very heterogeneous solutions and technologies on the market. They are not often very user-friendly, they are expensive, and users and doctors often have to face regulatory issues and problems with data integrity, security, and protection. There is also limited evidence of uh, validation and certification of uh, these services, and uh, uh, challenges in the implementation of telemedicines of telemedicine are also related to um, poor digital literacy of both healthcare professionals and patients. And also, uh, we must say that often physicians are skeptical about these uh, digital interventions. And last, uh, there is often difficulty in integrating uh, these solutions into healthcare system. As a matter of fact, uh, telemedicine is not uh, at the moment specifically recommended for hypertension management in most current guidelines. The only guidelines uh, giving some specific recommendations are the American guidelines. All the other guidelines give uh, no indications or only generic indications. But in this period of pandemic, uh, telemedicine uh, finally came at center stage and there is uh, um, emerging interest worldwide in uh, this uh, kind of approach for the um, management of uh, COVID patients because of course telemedicine can improve surveillance of these patients, can contain the spread of the disease and may favor early identification prompt management of these people. But there is another aspect. During emergency like this pandemic, there are also patients with uh, chronic conditions who are left at home alone and they need to be managed. Managed. These patients are hypertensive patients, patients with heart disease, with uh, lung disease, diabetes, and we need to ensure continuity of care in these patients. 
So in Italy, in this period, we have uh, quite uh, uh, a good experience uh, in managing these patients uh, with telemedicine, and we got uh, some nice uh, results, which I'm going to show you. First, an introduction about uh, the prevalence of chronic diseases in the Italian population. Approximately half of people living in Italy have at least one chronic condition. Hypertension is the most common chronic condition. And according to an analysis made by the National Institute of Health on uh, people dying for COVID in Italy during the pandemic, the majority of patients uh, dying had at least one uh, comorbidity. And the most uh, common comorbidity is hypertension. A very nice paper um, published recently and based on experience collected in an Italian hospital showed that uh, during the pandemic, there was a, a reduced hospitalization of patients for myocardial infarction because these people uh, were left uh, alone at home and so they were left uh, unmanaged. And there was uh, an increased mortality for myocardial infarction in patient showing uh, to the hospital. So this means that patients with hypertension, with hypertension, with a heart disease are not managed properly during an emergency. And here comes telemedicine, of course. We were quite popular in Italy <laughs> during this period because uh, we are um, providing telemedicine services uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. And so we had the occasion to uh, published some uh, nice uh, uh, interviews in uh, um, national uh, newspapers and uh, also a paper in uh, an international journal, journal discussing the role of telemedicine uh, during the pandemic in Italy. We collected experience on uh, uh, this uh, topic uh, with our um, web-based telemedicine platform, which is clinically validated and certified. And uh, we uh, manage uh, data on two uh, major settings. One was uh, uh, pharmacies, GP's offices, hospitals, where we provide uh, uh, counseling and medical opinion on some professional tests. But also, we also uh, followed patients uh, at home uh, with uh, uh, a smartphone application. Um, and patients were able to collect some uh, parameters, vital and non-vital signs at home, and share these parameters with us for counseling. In the last 10 years, we gather, gather a lot of experience managing uh, patients uh, uh, submitted to screening uh, uh, for um, various purposes, including certification for sport, uh, sport activities or occupational medicine, screening of subjects at risk of cardiovascular disease, but also uh, patients with specific diseases, mainly arterial hypertension, heart diseases, uh, um, lung diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, and so on. As you see, we collected a lot of uh, data in uh, um, pharmacies, GP's offices, and hospitals. And uh, these data are at the moment part of a big registry, which is uh, the Templar registry. And we made the first publication uh, last year where we were able to show some uh, data about the uh, level of blood pressure control in the population submitted to ABPM in uh, local pharmacies. And you can see that uh, uh, we show uh, a non-optimal blood pressure control over the 24 hours with ambulatory blood pressure, but we were also able to show the um, significant uh, prevalence of some sort of uh, hypertension uh, subtypes, which are quite dangerous. They are the 
isolated nocturnal hypertension and the mask hypertension. So we were able to prove that uh, these kind of uh, solutions provided to uh, community pharmacies and to GP's offices may be useful to um, uh, improve the uh, detection of uh, uh, uncontrolled blood pressure in uh, treated and untreated hypertensive patients. So what happened during the pandemic? This, this um, uh, graph show uh, what, is hap what uh, happened during the pandemic. This is the pre-lockdown period uh, and this is the lockdown period in Italy. The lockdown started uh, in, uh, at the beginning of March and ended uh, in the middle of May. Uh, this is the epidemic uh, car, you see. So we are improving, as you can see here. This is the last week. But you can see, interestingly, that during the lockdown, we had a huge drop in the number of tests performed in the pharmacies uh, and in the general practitioner's offices. But on the other side, we had a very huge increase in the number of people accessing uh, the website of uh, the uh, platform for seeking information about the disease and for trying to, to find some advice from, from us, we had also an increase in, in the number of uh, uh, app installations and in the number of home data provided by these patients. This is, these are the numbers, the huge drop in the pharmacy tests, but also the huge increase in the uh, data collected uh, uh, at uh, the um, home users. We tried to investigate uh, the features of uh, these tests and we found that in the pharmacies, during the lockdown, uh, the Age, the age of uh, the patients was older. There was a, a, a larger prevalence of uh, treated patients uh, and of patients with cardiovascular diseases compared to the pre-lockdown period. But also there was uh, an increase in the number of abnormal tests. You can see also that the distribution of these uh, tests was uh, uh, larger in the South because in the South, the prevalence of the pandemic was, uh, um, was I mean, the, the pandemic was milder than in the north and in the south of the country. On the contrary, you can see that the number of home users increased, as well as the number of readings taken at home. The user at home were younger during the lockdown than before the lockdown. But also there was an increase in the number of users taking antihypertensive drug treatments. And also the number of abnormal tests was uh, uh, lower compared to the period before the lockdown. So it seems that uh, the behavior of uh, home users was opposite compared to the behavior of the users presenting uh, to the pharmacies or GP's offices. So we tried to investigate, uh, uh, okay, you, you can see here a detail, these are the percentages of abnormal tests. You can see how the number, the percentage of abnormal tests increased in the pharmacies during the lockdown, but it decreased during the lockdown at home. We tried to investigate uh, uh, possible differences in the in the behavior of uh, users in the two settings. And you can see here that in the pharmacies, we had uh, an increase in the number of alter ECG tests during uh, uh, the lockdown. This is the lockdown, this is before the lockdown. But if you see here, we had an increase in the number of abnormal ECG but we add an improvement in the blood pressure control, probably because more treated patients were presenting to the uh, pharmacy and they were better managed by um, physicians. 
at all we observed an increase in the number of patients uh, measuring sp2 because uh, 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 in the media and in the newspapers, they were talking about the importance of measuring SP2 to uh, check the presence of COVID. So all the uh, patients were trying to seek a way to test this parameter at home. But again, you see that, uh, of course, uh, measuring a lot of SP2, uh, the prevalence of abnormal values of SP2 was very high during the lockdown, but you see that the blood pressure control was improved at all as it was in the pharmacy. So it seems that this system was able to uh, allow patients to achieve a better blood pressure control during the lockdown, but also it was able to uh, uh, discover that patients uh, uh, with uh, possible heart diseases or heart conditions could be, uh, could be managed uh, very appropriately in the pharmacies. So, uh, coming to the conclusion, our experience uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, uh, tells us that telemedicine may be efficient in the lockdown, during a lockdown to improve the management of uh, patients with chronic conditions. And this means that we need uh, finally to promote a transition to a more modern model of care which must integrate telemedicine services in the armamentarium of healthcare services. And this should involve the community pharmacies and general practitioners because our experience is that these settings are very efficient in managing patients. We should consider that telemedicine, telemedicine is not something to be used only in case of emergency, but should be a proactive approach to secure continuity of care to patients with uh, hypertension of chronic diseases. We need to push uh, medical societies to supplement current national and international guidelines with specific recommendation on the use of telemedicine for hypertension management, specifically in some subgroup of patients. We should understand that telemedicine is fundamental to create networks between healthcare professionals and patients, of course, to effectively uh, improve prevention of cardiovascular diseases. We are often skeptical about mobile health. Our data demonstrate that, and also research data demonstrate that mobile health can be useful if properly management, managed under the supervision of uh, healthcare professional to improve um, uh, blood pressure control and other outcomes in the patient because it uh, involves, it, it engages the patient in the long-term uh, management of his condition. And secondly, and, and uh, sorry, last, last telemedicine um, is not so expensive as uh, we think, and it may represent an efficient time and money saving approach to the management of chronic disease patients. And before concluding, I wish to tell you that, that if you need, you need to stay tuned because come, some, something is coming very soon. We will publish very soon an expert position paper. We have collected the, uh, all the major experts in uh, uh, telemedicine and hypertension management, and we will provide some uh, very nice uh, um, recommendations uh, about uh, telemedicine and use in hypertension management. Thank you very much. So, uh, Anastasia, you have the word. 
Thank you. Sorry, I had a bit of a technical problems. Thank you very much, Stefano. Um, we will start the questions now. Could I ask for all participants to write their questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat box? Um, Stefano, I might start with you, if that's all right. Um, um, could you um, let us know what do you think will be, the, in the near future, the most effective telemedicine approach for hypertension management, please? Uh, yes, based on our experience and also on the data Richard uh, presented, uh, I think the best approach to um, hypertension management with telemedicine is the multidisciplinary approach. So we need to involve, uh, involve uh, several healthcare professionals and to uh, monitor uh, um, several parameters. So telemonitoring blood pressure telemonitoring, compliance telemonitoring should be uh, the most important uh, part of telemedicine. Teleconsultation is also important, uh, as well as uh, uh, drug titration. I agree with Richard that self-management is very important. So we need to involve patients with telemedicine in the management of their condition. This will be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefanos. Thank you, thank you Anastasia. Uh, so the, the question session is open as Anastasia stated previously. I, I will have a question uh, from the, uh, for, for Richard. So Richard, uh, what are the key mechanisms of action that result in lower blood pressure in those who self or telemonitor their, their, their blood pressure at home? Well, thanks, Alex. Um, I think that uh, the data that I've shown uh, tonight um, suggests that the, the main mechanism is from uh, enhanced use of antihypertensive medication. And I think what this is showing is that telemedicine allows us to do two things uh, in terms of the uh, patients. Uh, it gives them more control, uh, makes them more likely to take their medications, which leads to lower blood pressure. And I think at least as importantly uh, for physicians, uh, it reduces clinical inertia. And by that, I mean it, it reduces the, the, the fact that many physicians, and this is both hospital physicians and uh, primary care physicians, tend not to act on raised blood pressures. They're very good at recording them in the records, but they tend not to act on them. And as I showed you, uh, if you get patients to adjust their own medication, they can actually do it better than the doctors because they act on their readings uh, more regularly. So what telemedicine does is it allows us to bring the best of both worlds. It brings them the knowledge from the physicians uh, and it allows patients to take control, take their medication more appropriately. Uh, we have looked at things like uh, uh, and I can see on the chat there's been some questions about things like uh, diet and uh, exercise and weight management and so on. Uh, those things are all important and in the trials of those specifically each one of those interventions such as losing weight or uh, increasing exercise is associated with small reductions of blood pressure maybe three to five millimeters systolic but actually in the telemonitoring trials that I've done certainly we've not actually shown any difference in those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we have a lot of participants today and uh, there are a lot of questions. So I will just uh, um, try to, to ask uh, uh, the following question. And this is uh, maybe, uh, maybe the two speakers can, can answer. So are there any groups for whom you would not recommend self-monitoring of hypertension? Richard, if you could. Okay. So. Um, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, I think there are some people for whom self-monitoring is actually very difficult as an individual, and that might be people who've had a stroke and who can't um, physically uh, use the equipment. Uh, it may be people um, who, uh, who just don't want to, 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 to self-monitor. Um, I think that for some of those groups, people who are unable to, uh, that self-monitoring can be be, be done just using uh, their carers or, or, or family members to help them. 
uh, I think one interesting point is that physicians are often worried about anxiety in their patients. But whenever we've looked at this in our trials, we've failed to find any increase in anxiety when we've looked at, uh, at it in the control group compared to the intervention group. So I suspect that anxiety is uh, a, a less important thing than, than perhaps some physicians think. Uh, and we do often find that uh, physicians are a bit surprised where we've sent out invitations to a large number of hypertensives in their practice. There are always a few people who they're very surprised have, have agreed to take part of it. So, so my view would be offer self-monitoring to everyone, uh, make it as easy as possible um, through whatever um, healthcare system that you're working in to have access to both monitors and, and, and the equipment that we've been talking about tonight. Uh, and uh, there will be some people who choose not to, uh, but as I showed you, uh, uh, really very large numbers of people worldwide are, are doing this. I, I, yes, I agree with Richard. I would add that uh, our experience is that uh, uh, the, the problem with uh, self-monitoring and particularly with telemonitoring is uh, the sustainability. So uh, there is a, a, a drop in the um, compliance and persistence of patients. So uh, this is particularly true for self-monitoring because there is no control, direct control by, by, by the doctor. For telemonitoring is uh, less uh, frequent, but it's something that uh, uh, we should think uh, uh, upon because it, this is a, a major problem with these patients. Thank you. They lose interest after a while. Um, I might ask if that's okay, Alex, um, a question to, to Richard. There's a question, I don't know if you noticed that it's um, uh, specifically for the hemodialysis patients. Could self-monitoring blood pressure uh, at specific times be similarly beneficial in this population, which is a, a key issue and much harder to control blood pressure? Sure. Well, uh, you'll understand that I'm a family physician, so I don't have a lot of experience in hemodialysis. And it may be that actually Silvano knows more about this than me. Uh, I don't see any particular reason why uh, you shouldn't use uh, self-monitoring in it. Um, there have been there has been some work uh, in in self monitoring in in in, a, in dialysis that I'm afraid I'm not I'm not very familiar um, with. I'll perhaps look it up and see if I can tweet something about it uh, later. Um, but um, but there's no particular reason. And uh, I from a very long time ago I remember that that the there are particular issues uh, coming up to. Uh, uh, dialysis um, in in the perhaps the day before dialysis when people can get fluid overloaded and so on uh, and uh, there's no particular reason why self-monitoring perhaps of weight as well as blood pressure uh, could be useful in that circumstance. Stefano do you want to contribute anything to the question? Uh, yes um... I am a cardiologist, so uh, I, I don't have so much experience with kidney patients, but I am aware that the literature is not uh, so rich uh, for these uh, patients, um, but uh, self-monitoring is quite uh, popular in these patients. There are some practical aspects due to, uh, you know, that they have to place uh, the, the cuff on the arm where they make dialysis. It depends on time of, of type of dialysis, but it's quite popular. Thank you very much, guys. So a lot of questions. Uh, I, will, I will start um, asking, uh, so for Stefano, um, from one, one participant, I would like to know if you have any experience in managing um, um, blood hypertension in elderly with cognitive disorder. How is blood pressure self-monitoring uh, applied here? With, sorry? Uh, cognitive disorders. Ah, okay. Definitely with cognitive disorders. Can we, can we implement? Yes, we have, uh, uh, we are monitoring a lot of these patients in the pharmacies. 
there are patients with uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson disease. There are some uh, patients uh, with uh, which cannot which uh, are monitored at home because they are uh, in bed, and we have uh, quite good experience with these uh, with these people. Uh, um, also in terms of compliance to this uh, technique. But my experience is limited to ABPM in this patient, which is not so easy because they have to wear the device for 24 hours. But my experience is very good. And um, it is very important, this kind of um, um, approach, uh, because these patients have usually a very, very uh, high blood pressure variability and they have a very high blood pressure at night. And so this uh, kind of tool is very uh, useful because they have no possibility to check ABPM in another way because it's they have difficulty to go to the hospital. And so if they go to the pharmacy or the pharmacist is, go, is, is visiting their them home and um, we have a plenty of data with these patients. Thank you very much, Stefano. So just, uh, I would like to thank to all the participants. Uh, I saw Professor Kaiser Sergio from Brazil, who is watching uh, a good friend, also Professor Krina Sinescu, which I personally know. Thank you all for participating. The next question will be for, for uh, Professor McManus. Um, so Richard, uh, we saw uh, that there was a, a decrease in uh, myocardial infection rates during the COVID period. Uh, do you have any, any information if uh, 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 there, were, um, there was an increase uh, in uh, uh, acute stroke during this period, during the COVID period? We might deduce that, uh, you know, like th there were uh, uh, less myocardial infarction at the hospital, but uh, we saw uh, bigger uh, rates uh, of cardiac arrest, out of hospital cardiac arrest. So we might, we could deduce that uh, also, this could apply for hypertension. Do you have any information regarding this subject? So, I, I think that the data on this um, are not yet completely clear, but I annex, understand anecdotally in the UK, talking to colleagues who are stroke physicians, that the number of people presenting at, at hospitals with stroke has significantly dropped, and even, even more with uh, transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. Uh, because patients are afraid of, uh, of going to hospital at the time. And this seems to be largely people with minor stroke uh, and, uh, and TIA. Obviously, people who, who have a, a, a very significant stroke may have no choice about going to hospital. I think that the, the, the literature would suggest that, that uh, this will have a, a, a very detrimental effect in long-term outcomes. Uh, and in the UK, similar uh, issues have also been seen in our urgent cancer services. So 80% um, uh, reduction in uh, acute referrals for what we call two-week wait in the UK, which is people who the GP considers may well have cancer. Uh, and I think that all of this put together, uh, in coming months, it may well turn out that the the really awful death toll that we've seen from COVID-19 in the UK uh, and elsewhere. Uh, it, 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 uh, Stefano knows about Italy uh, as well. Uh, actually becomes overshadowed by uh, problems that we, see, we start to see uh, with cardiovascular disease and cancer, where people have been unable to or, or unwilling to seek treatment uh, and uh, unable to, to find treatment. I think that the, the, the se seminar this evening is really important in thinking about that because clearly telemedicine gives us a way to manage patients. Um, we know from uh, work published in the, in the BMJ in 2016 by Zhu et al. that uh, if one delays in uh, titrating antihypertensives, it actually can uh, result in increased cardiovascular events. Uh, and one would expect, um, I've done a bit of back of the envelope calculations, and I reckon that there may well have been um, 500 additional cardiovascular events per month after the first six weeks of lockdown with people not 
not attending. Now, that's my guess um, based on the literature, and we won't know for, uh, until later on in the year when we can look back and see if that's actually happened. But if that has actually happened, then, then that could prove to be a really significant problem over and above the, the obviously terrible um, impact of COVID-19 itself. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I might ask something which, uh, to both of uh, you and Stefano. The question came up about uh, chronotherapy you know, and in terms of evening doses, particularly where there's been a lot of controversy about uh, a particular paper. But I'd like to hear your views about whether you recommend to your patients or whether the patients who are self-monitoring, uh, uh, self-management uh, are alternating their medication. Richard, first. Well, I was going to say to Stefano, I want to say something because I've been talking a bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you mean? Uh, uh, so you mean? Do you uh, recommend, the, 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 recommend that they should be taking it at night rather than you know in the morning or morning and night? We all have different views on that. Uh, our experience is that uh, we've. Uh, ABPM, uh, we uh, usually have to recommend, especially um, for elderly, um, to take uh, additional drugs before going to bed. But we never, we never skip the morning dose in this case. So usually these patients are adding some drugs uh, before uh, going to bed. Uh, because uh, their blood pressure is high at night and the GP does, didn't know because they never had an ABPM. And so after we did uh, telemonitoring, we could advise to add a drug. It's also happened in this period. I had some patients um, doing a home blood pressure telemonitoring in the lockdown and uh, uh, I had to add drugs in, in, the, in, the, in the evening. So it's not unusual. So what I would say, Anastasia, from my point of view, if you look at the epidemiology, nighttime blood pressure does seem to be more associated with outcome than daytime yeah, uh, blood sure. pressure. So there, there are theoretical reasons why this should um, be important. Um, the literature, as you intimated, uh, has been dominated by one group um, who published a, a series of studies which show really extraordinary reductions in cardiovascular disease by uh, reducing, uh, by giving medication in the evening rather than the morning. I think that, uh, that that's, in, in a way it's encouraging. I think people have questioned those results because of quite the extent of the, blood, of the uh, event reduction. But, uh, but the proof will come when another group uh, is able to um, do, do some similar work. And I believe that uh, Tom MacDonald, a colleague uh, in Scotland, uh, has the TIME study with over 10,000 patients randomised in a rather elegant uh, internet-based uh, design. Uh, and that's a, an event-driven study, which is, uh, I believe, in the next year or so, should have accumulated enough events to, to give us an answer one way or the other. Um, I think that the fact that that study hasn't reported early um, suggests that the data monitoring committee have not seen the kind of reductions in events that would have uh, come should had the um, uh, the Hamida um, studies uh, in the European Heart Journal been replicated in the UK version. But obviously. Uh, I don't know. I, that's just my, me guessing at the moment. I think it's an interesting hypothesis, and, and, uh, and I think we just need a bit more data, really, to know one way or the other. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask there's a recurrent question from different people about the diabetic patients and uh, whether, they, whether they, what type of information do they need, different information, uh, their, their compliance. Would you, either of you like to comment? Well, I, I can start talking about the, the diabetic patients. Uh, obviously, in primary care, we, we look after lots of people with diabetes. I think that there are differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes in terms of the kind of targets that one would want 
to use. In the UK, the most recent national guidance have suggested that for uh, people with type 2 diabetes without complications, actually, we should be doing much the same things uh, as we do uh, for people without diabetes, same kind of targets, similar kind of uh, drugs. And most people are on uh, two or more drugs, so the, the actual choice of drugs um, matters perhaps a bit less. There are theoretical reasons why one might want to use ACE uh, and ARBs more in people with diabetes, but probably the main thing is lowering, lowering blood pressure. Um, in type 1 diabetes and those with uh, complications, uh, it seems uh, appropriate to use lower, lower targets, uh, and that, that uh, can be reflected using the telemonitoring approach. You just program in a, a, a lower target, uh, and those targets tend to be slightly moving uh, depending on which country you live and what year the guideline has been published. So um, I, I'm not going to stick my neck out too much on, on those. Thank you very much for the journey. Uh, so we have time for four more questions uh, and uh, after we'll end the webinar. I have a question for Stefano. So Stefano, what is this uh, uh, there, uh, uh, threshold for um, uh, ambulatory hypertension? Uh, what is the cutoff for uh, tele, tele hypertension measure at home? Does, this, does the cutoff differ from the guidelines should we use another uh, limit for ambulatory uh, hypertension or, or the hypertension we are recording via telemedicine or we should stick to the same numbers we already know? There is no difference between uh, ABPM and tele-ABPM or home BPM and tele-home BPM. Uh, the only difference is uh, that uh, for uh, telemedicine, you have uh, the possibility to uh, get um, some advice from uh, a specialist, uh, either if you are a pharmacist or a GP, or if you are a patient. This is the, uh, the advantage that you may not have. For instance, we have also uh, GPs making uh, ABPM uh, with our platform but uh, they i mean they ask our advice only seldom and we see that uh, if they managed their patient alone they may not uh, be uh, good in uh, making their diagnosis with abpm so in this case we are uh, useful because we can give them advice and improve their um, uh, possibility and, they, and, their, and their ability to, to look at this, at this test. But there is no difference in the thresholds. The only, the only problem is, 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 as I mentioned, is guidelines are not giving any specific uh, recommendations on how we should use telemedicine in hypertensive patients, how and when. So this, this, is a, this is a pity. <laughs> yeah, we're waiting uh, uh, your guidelines. Uh, you and, and, uh, yeah, we are trying with Richard and all the experts to, to try to get some advice. Of course, the, we, we are trying to, to do our best. I might ask one question which come up there. I think, Stefano, you mentioned it in terms of pharmacists. Um, and one of the questions is the role of pharmacists play in, in mo mo continuing the monitoring of these patients. Do you want to comment? Um, you mean I didn't get the question very well because it, it the is, signal is disturbed. Because in some countries, unlike Italy, pharmacists uh, don't take over control. They measure blood pressure in, in the pharmacy, but they don't. Yeah, sure. Very badly most of the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at what least in know? Italy, in Italy, pharmacists are measuring blood pressure in the pharmacy, but not properly. And sometimes they don't even know exactly the thresholds. So sometimes they give very bad advice to the patient. But for ABPM, uh, we found uh, very good cooperation with pharmacists. 
because uh, uh, they realize that ABPM is a very useful tool. And so uh, we were very efficient in creating a network between the pharmacist and the GP and us. So usually the flow is that, that the GP is uh, selecting the patient to be referred to the pharmacist the pharmacist is trained, so we train and certify the pharmacist about the guidelines, and then we provide the ABPM. So the pharmacist is able to give some advices to, to the patient about uh, the results of the test before sending the patient to the, to, to, the, to the GP because it is trained by us. This is very successful. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Richard, um, what, what is going on with the COVID crisis? How, how should we change our management regarding to uh, our hypertensive uh, patients? So there, is a, uh, there has been a, a huge debate concerning uh, stopping the ACE inhibitors. What's your, your opinion on that, Richard? Uh, can you please tell us in, in 30 seconds? Sure. I mean, I think it's interesting. Uh, early on in the COVID crisis, there was a letter written to the Lancet suggesting some uh, theoretical reasons why uh, blockade of the renal angiotensin system might be bad. Uh, and then uh, much more recently, there's actually been some data uh, uh, and three papers published in the New England Journal a few weeks ago. Uh, and none of those three papers um, suggested that there was any harm uh, at all uh, Subsequently, people have put forward theories that actually the uh, renin angiotensin system blockade might be uh, a good thing. Um, I, I think what is clear is that every uh, national and international society of hypertension and cardiology that I've seen has put out pretty strong statements saying, please do not stop these treatments uh, because uh, that may well cause harm uh, rather than, than good. So. Uh, the other thing just to say is that although the early data suggested that hypertension uh, was overrepresented in those uh, dying from uh, COVID, certainly in the UK, large database studies uh, and the emerging data doesn't, doesn't really su suggest that at, at all. The risk was a 0 0.95 with uh, crossing unity uh, in, the, in the primary care data, data set for hypertension being associated with, with death from COVID. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so to make it uh, uh, even and fair, uh, the, next qu the next question is for Stefano. So Stefano, can you just briefly, in 30 seconds, one minute, can you just explain us uh, how Italy managed the COVID crisis related to hypertension and hypertensive patients? Oh, in Italy, uh, there was uh, the big issue of uh, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So um, I have some uh, good relationship uh, with a pharmacist and they got crazy because uh, uh, there were a lot of patients uh, uh, coming to the pharmacist with uh, prescriptions from their GPs to change, to drop the ACE inhibitors in the ARBs and to change the drugs. So we uh, tried to uh, give some advice based on uh, uh, tests we, we did in the pharmacy, uh, but we had this problem in Italy and the um, Italian Society of Hypertension had uh, to publish um, a document uh, advising uh, all GPs and pharmacists and everyone about uh, um, the fact that this drug should not be um, dropped. So that, that's uh, the, ex the experience. Thank you very much. Thank you to, to all of you. Uh, I would like to especially thank Anastasia, who is uh, awake at this hour. I think it's uh, 3 a.m. in Australia. So thank you very much, Anastasia, for your help, your precious help. I would also like to thank Professor McManus. I would also like to thank Professor Omboni. Thank you uh, to all of you for this excellent webinar. Uh, we could not put all the questions. I think there were uh, at least 50 important questions, but maybe we can see each other uh, uh, in six months or one year to discuss this further. Um, so on behalf of the International Society of Telemedicine and Health, I would like to thank you for the participation. Uh, I would also like to thank the participants. 
uh, and uh, I hope to see you at the next webinar. We have to close the session because it's very late. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.